praise team. Thank you so much, Shannon and Nate, this morning. And uh, all those behind the scenes that make it happen, really enjoy the worship. And uh, taking that time out of our busy week and our hectic weeks and just <clears throat> quieting ourselves before the Lord and praying and uh, having Him speak to us and us offering our praise to Him with our voices, uh, both great and small, and uh, also witnessing uh, little Alex following the Lord with this incredible step of baptism this morning. What a privilege that is for our church and what a privilege it is for Chris and Lisa Walkwood and that family. Um, well, let's, um, let's recap what we're looking at in this series of messages. Just for a few weeks, we've taken a, uh, a time and designated it a part of, of looking at our homes and looking at the house and looking at our house. But it's not our house, it's his house. Last week, we talked about marriage. And uh, how many of you have just totally revolutionized your marriage? Yeah, thank you very much. I see all those hands. Uh, this week we're going to talk about parenting, and uh, we're going to talk about parenting next week also. Um, the biggest thing about marriage is, about your own marriage, is just take time to invest in it uh, here and there once in a while. Um, you don't always know what your, your spouse is thinking, so, so think about how you can invest in your marriage to show them that they are still a priority, uh, the priority for your life other than... Uh, your, your salvation through Jesus Christ and your walk with Him because that reflects how your marriage is going to be. And then the next most important relationship we see is with children, with children. So we're going to be talking about parenting this morning. And uh, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6. And um, first of all, how many of you have parents? Anybody in here have parents? Yeah. Yeah, I... Uh, I, I have the privilege of knowing a, a, a lot of your parents in multi-generational church. It's such a neat thing, knowing parents, children, grandchildren. Uh, it's, it's awesome. But uh, how many of you are a parent? How many of you have children? Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's good. Um, how many of you someday will probably be a parent, Lord willing? Anyone? <laughs> yes, there we go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but how many of you wish you were a parent? Anyone like that this morning? Okay, well, good. It's a message for you. <laughs> how many of you refuse to answer on the grounds you may be incriminated? Yeah, that's me right there. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not going there. You figure that out if I'm a parent or not. Absolutely. Well, we know, we know if you have children, we know that parenting is an absolute privilege. It is a reward. Um, you remember that first kid that you had and you finally get a break away. Maybe your, your mom or dad or some relative or some friend says, hey, I want to babysit for you so you and your husband can go have a night out by yourself and just go do. And, and so you get away from the house and, and what do you find yourself doing? All you do is talk about the kid. That's it. And, and you thought it was going to be so much fun, but you realize it's not. Say and I were married almost 13 years before we, we had children. And, um, you know, going here and there, a lot of different things going on. Sam was getting another degree in college, and we thought we were really going to adopt. Her mom was adopted. That was kind of our goal. And then we, you know, decided the biological clock is ticking. So we said, let's, uh, if we're going to have a baby, we need to get going. So if we'd, have, if we'd have known what we knew, how empty our lives were without our children, we would have had them much, much earlier. They're just... Uh, an absolute joy. It gives so much to us. It's such a reward. And you know, a lot of our life's greatest joys are through being a parent. It is a great calling of God to be a parent and to bestow that on us. But also, it has its challenges, and parenting can be difficult. We know that at times it can be difficult. Now, of all, there's 18 cousins. My mom, my mom has 18 grandchildren. Gabe and Abby are the, or Gabe is the youngest of those. So a lot of them now are married and have children of their own. And, uh, and, and it's kind of an interesting dynamic to see, you know, who they've married and who they're, what they're doing with their life and, and all of that. But um, it, it reminds you of how difficult parenting can be because there are just no, there are just no guarantees. There are no guarantees that children are going to turn out one way. Uh, when Gabe turned 18 back on April the 24th, I had my little my little speech with him that I had with Abby when she turned 18. That from now you're 18, and from now on, your decisions are your decisions. I, your mom and I will always be there for you. We will always love you. 
But I can't tell you we're going to bail you out of circumstances that you get yourself into because those decisions that you make are your decisions. They're not our decisions. You know what we expect. You know what the Lord expects of you. You can do what you want. You are now a grown man. You're now a grown woman. You can make your own choices. But just remember that you will own your choices. Your decisions will be your decisions. And that's a little bit sobering because you're thinking, have I taught them? Have I instructed them throughout growing up for all these years that, that they know everything they need to know to go on with their life? So uh, we took Gabe to college a week ago. I think it was a week ago. And um, Gabe decided in the last couple of weeks that he wanted to take a bike to college. And he says, well, I want to get a bike. I'm going to ride my bike around the campus. And I said, well... You know, I bought your mom this bike, a really nice bike, when she was pregnant with you. Because she said she wanted to get in shape after she had the baby. Guys, not the smartest move in the world, but I surprised her with this beautiful bicycle when she was eight months pregnant. Um, never did ride it. And so it's hung upside down in our garage in Des Moines and then all the way down here to Alabama. And uh, so I said, well, we'll just take that bike down. It's hardly been ridden. And, and you can take that to, to with you. Well, when we moved down here, Gabe was just learning to ride a bike and had been riding for just a short time. He was five years old. We moved into our new development. There wasn't really a good place to ride a bicycle. So he didn't ride much. I mean, it was either up or downhill. And it was just an accident way to happen. So uh, he, he and some other issues in our neighborhood. So he just didn't, didn't ride it that much. So um, when we get to college, he unloads his bike from the car and he starts walking it over to the dorm to lock it up. And, and his sister says, Gabe, why don't you just ride your bike over there? And he stops and he says, because I haven't ridden since I was five years old. <laughs> and I'm only going to practice when no one's watching. <laughs> so I pictured him out in the parking lot, you know, going around in circles, around in circles, trying to figure out how to ride a bike again. But when they go away, you know, you, you hope you've made the decisions. Well, the Lord gives us some incredible instruction in Ephesians chapter 6. And it's easy when we go through it to kind of to breeze over it and say, oh, that's good. That's really great. You know, that, that's really wonderful. But there's really a lot to unpack there. And it speaks to a lot of what is needed in our parenting for our children and what they need in turn from what we do as parents. Um, parenting can be difficult. There's a top uh, list of the most uh, toughest uh, stressful leadership positions in America uh, by Forbes magazine. They did this like number nine was uh, CEO of any company is a tough leadership position, but it goes on down the line. Number five was a pastor, a rabbi or a holy man. So um, then there's uh, number four, a football coach. So when you guys are watching your football, just know that Nick Saban's stress, Gus Mazon's stress and mine are real close. It's just a little bit more stressful than, than mine. But then uh, number three is the most stressful, toughest leadership position is to be second in command of any organization. So there, Zach has, has trumped me in the stress and the, the, the uh, level there that it is. Number two is a university president. So all these different positions that are the most stressful. But, you know, they, what they found was number one, and they had all this criteria that they based it on by Forbes. Forbes um, dot com, but it is the uh, stay-at-home parent has the most stress. Stay-at-home parent. That's amazing, isn't it? That's amazing. Anyway, Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. But bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So this morning we're going to look at two principles from this passage of Scripture. And they are what children need of the authority and the control. Authority and control. Now those sound uh, very legalistic in some ways, but you're going to see that it's not legalistic in any way. But authority and control from this passage of Scripture. The first uh, thing of authority, this is we, we've got to teach our children that uh, God has a design for their life, and all of that design involves authority over them. 
When they're born into the world, they're born into a family, they're born into under the authority of, of their parents, under the authority of, of authority throughout their entire life. Their elders over them, uh, they, they're under the authority of their teachers, of a boss one day, uh, of the law of the land. All of these things, there is that authority that is going to be over their life. And it isn't easy to teach kids that there's authority because we, come, we, we always have this natural desire to rebel against authority. We're born with it, a, a rebel's heart. Um, mankind naturally rejects uh, authority, rebels against authority. You turn on the news, all that you'll see at the core of, of everything on the news that's negative going on is a rebellion against authority. Um, every one of us has experienced this in our life, and we're, we're learning still to this day that there is an authority over us. And even this, in our culture, in our society today, they don't want to hear this. We don't, this is not something they want to hear. This is not something that is popular because there is no authority. I am my own authority. But every one of us comes into the world thinking that we are little sovereigns, that we're in charge. We come into this world thinking that uh, we know best, uh, that we are in charge, we set our own rules, and we'll even at some point bully or manipulate others and demand our own way. We know best, or so we think, and where does this come from? This comes from our natural man or the sin nature that we're born with, that we inherited from Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden that is passed upon all men, this rebellion against God and against every authority in there. And children are raised, they don't know it, but this is what they do is, is rebel. And before them, I, uh, we also rebelled as, as when we were growing up in, in some way. And we understand this truth when we become parents because we see the rebellion more easily when we have children. When we have children. Now, our pediatrician in Ankeny, Iowa was named Dr. Bilgey. And he was a, a little guy about this tall. He was an Indian man <coughs> that was instructed in uh, medicine in London. And somehow he ended up in Iowa, and um, it was, it, it, and, and so he was our, a very popular pediatrician, Dr. Bilgey. And um, so we, we, you know, <laughs> you remember going around interviewing pediatricians to see who's going to be your pediatrician, choosing a good pediatrician, you know? You know why I chose him? It was because he was brown. Because he was brown. That's why I chose him. We're in Scandinavian country, and I wanted our kids to have an interaction with someone who was dark skinned and dark complected and dark haired and 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 get that completely out and that played out at the time very pivotal uh, throughout their life but anyway dr bilgey he said to us oh you're going to be great when you have your parent when you have your baby your first baby abby and um and he said you'll you'll uh, baby sleep about 20 hours out of the, the day and he told us all that and and abby was is our strong willed child abby fights I, I can't even wrap myself, my mind around this concept, but she fights sleep. Now, from growing up, doesn't want to go to sleep, doesn't want to go to sleep. Fighting. Why, why when you're just a baby, do you want to fight sleep? Why, why do you want to, why, where is this coming from? I mean, sleep is good. Sleep is wonderful. You get to dream good dreams. You get to relax. You get to go. You get to be refreshed. You open up. I mean, even to this day, if I get up in the middle of the night, half the time, Abby would go, Daddy, are you okay? What's up? What's going on? Oh, nothing. I just got to let the dog out. You know, she's up. It's 3 in the morning. Abby, why don't you go to bed? I mean, she sleeps 2 and 3 hours a night. It's crazy. She's just, just weird like that. But she, she is that strong-willed child. And we see this rebellion that is built up into the heart of a child in, in Abby and also in our, in our children. And you've probably seen this played out in, the ch in your own children. And so as parents, we find ourselves going from one battle to another battle, one battle to another battle. Um, Gabe growing up, I can remember two times, there's probably more than this, but two times where he just threw a fit. That two-year-old, three-year-old type fit. One, we were on a trip to, to Orlando, Disney World, and we took a break from the park and we went to a Chick-fil-A to eat. And Gabe had a meltdown in the middle of Chick-fil-A and he went down underneath the table and there was Abby, his older sister, 18 months old, and we were saying, now we just sat there like, there was nothing going on. He was throwing a fit at lunchtime. Everybody in the whole restaurant was like, would you shut that kid up? We were just like enjoying our chicken nuggets and dipping them and taking a drink. We didn't care. We were just like, just let him go. Then another time he, he had one was on an airplane. And I won't bore you. I won't, I won't tell you that story, but that was awful to have a kid throwing a fit on an airplane. It was horrible. Um, well, Abby, I can remember two times, I think, that she never threw a fit. 
Don't you tell me she didn't throw a fit. You know, you, you, you have children like this, right? Well, listen, our responsibility as parents is to teach our children that they are born into a world of authority and they are not it. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right, it says. This is right. If they can't obey you, how are they going to obey anybody else? How are they going to get along with their peers? How are they going to interact with others? How are they going to interact with their boss or with their teachers throughout their life? They're going to struggle with this until they learn that they are not the authority. More, most importantly, how will they ever submit to Jesus as Lord? Now, if we don't teach our children authority, fortunately in our culture and society today, and I rail against uh, American Christianity that it is not biblical Christianity in a lot of different ways, they're going to fit right in because they don't, we don't present Jesus as Lord of our life. That, he, that we submit to Him, that His Word is the ultimate authority over our life, and we bow our will to that, and, and we will do whatever we need to to please the Lord, and we will conform our life to what God's authority is over us. But uh, with, with children, that they've got to, at some point, submit to Jesus Christ as Lord. That's who He is, that He's going to be the Lord of their life, that they're going to surrender the direction of their life for Him. I got the privilege of being a Awana game guy last week, and every one of our, our children in our in our in our Awana program is absolutely awesome. But it was so funny to to get to know these kids. You know, some of them uh, you might say, "Well, I bet they have. I bet they're a hyperactive child." You know, but that's a hyper. No, they're not hyper. They're just a boy. Okay, but hyperactivity or attention deficit disorder. You know, we hear a lot about that. I found out last last year as the Awana game guy that. That some kids are just JDRA, just don't respect authority. And these are not our non church kids, these are our church children that, as you're announcing the rules for the game, they're automatically deciding how they're going to break that rule and thinking about, I'm going to do the exact opposite of what, of what uh, Jerry, the game guy, wants. And I'm going to mess it up for everybody. And, 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 and you know, they're a work in progress. This is, a, this is something that, that will change in them. I remember my kids were once in a one up also rebelling against whatever the authority was. But, um, you know, when we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, our salvation it is a transfer of who is in charge of our life, of who the authority is in our life. 2 Corinthians 5.15 says this, And Jesus died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves. So going from what you once were to what you now are, but for Him who for their sake died and was raised. So there is that idea of, of, of surrendering to the authority that is in your life. And that ultimate authority is your relationship with Jesus Christ. You know, children have to learn why they do what they do. And teaching them to answer the question, why do they sometimes not obey? Why they sometimes don't do what they're, they're supposed to do? Why they tend to stray and do what they're not supposed to do? We've got to understand that there's a sin nature there. There is a fallen nature that speaks to us and it, and it wants to be building up ourselves. It wants to speak to ourselves in our flesh and satisfy that. And, and a lot of times when that happens, the authority is the first thing to go in our life. You know, we see how parents respond. And I've been in both these camps, tried both these things as a parent. But you either give up and give in so you avoid conflict. You just pick your battles, or really, you don't pick any battles is, is what you do. Sometimes you make a stand, but most of the time, you just retreat. And that is the way, that's like a hands-off parenting. You do what you want, you, you little sovereign. Or you fall in the other camp, where basically you're a harsh disciplinarian. Where you just, you have a set of rigid rules, and there's no room, and the kid is a nervous, absolute wreck. But being able to respond properly to authority is fundamental to a successful Christian life. And we have to agree on that. We have to agree that children need to understand where they are in the authority of God. We love our children by providing security through patient uh, direction and guidelines. Rules are taught. They're not dictated. But discipline in the home can lead to discipline in their walk with the Lord. And I love the last line of verse number four. It says, bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So here is this two-pronged effect where we have patient instruction and we have discipline also. And discipline doesn't mean they just get to do whatever they want, whenever they want. Uh, it, it, is, it is also a time of correction and then teaching them of why that is wrong and why they shouldn't do what they do. You know, 
difference between these two things, we don't, we ha we don't have absolute authority over our children. And this is a, an amazing awakening for us as parents when we realize we are not the absolute authority over our children. We have ambassadorial authority. We're like an ambassador for, for the kingdom of God over our children. They are loaned to us for, for the, this life, and our job is to instruct in them and to pour into them and put into them the, the, uh, where they are in, under God's authority. Under God's authority. What does God continually say and reinforce to us? What does He continually say to us as His children, as our Heavenly Father? What does He continually reinforce to us? Every time I'm quiet with Him, every time I'm in a worship service, every time I ponder the relationship that I have with Him or I'm spending time with Him in prayer, I, I feel this reinforcement. I love you and I want what is best for you. When I've messed up, when I've wronged the, the, the Lord, I've messed up in my walk to the Lord and, and I'm, I'm speaking to Him about that and I'm being sensitive with Him and as the authority over my life, I hear the same thing. I love you and I want what is best for you. And this is the same thing that we do with our children. We continually say and reinforce to them, I love you and I want what is best for you regardless of what they've done or regardless of where they are in their life. So the authority, they've got to understand that there is an authority over their life. The second thing is, and it, it would be like a subtitle if this was a book, control. Control. Control of their heart. And we control their heart and not their behavior. You know, when we think about all the things, the needs that our children have, um, we lived in an older home and we were rehabbing that home. We bought it, moved into it, and we were living there in Des Moines. We were rehabbing this home and... And all of a sudden, Sam's pregnant with, with Abby, and so we, I decided for some reason that I had to get everything done before, before uh, Abby got there. Like, she would know that it wasn't right, you know? But you get these funny ideas in your mind. So we, re, we remodeled the whole thing. I'm trying to get this all, all ready for her. Um, and we had this transition from the new tile that I put down in the, um, in the uh, uh, what is it, dining room and the kitchen down to the hardwood floors. There's this little transition. And having to learn to walk, like stopping and stepping up over that. And she had to fall and hurt. You know, that, that with, one of the needs of children is protection and authority. You know, you child-proof your home. You child-proof your home. So this, you know, we just can't have this anymore because they're going to hurt themselves. Or they're going to get hurt by this. So we know that is a need of our children, protection and authority uh, and security, but also guidance and instruction. Children need that. Wisdom and understanding. Children need that. And discipline. We also know they need love and forgiveness. That where they will be is not where they are today. They're not perfect. They're going to make mistakes. And in those times they need that love and forgiveness. But they also need to understand that their greatest need is who they allow to control their heart. Who they allow to control their heart. Kids, they cannot be left to raise themselves. And we see this a lot where we just allow our children to make decisions that they are not, they're not capable of making. We can control what and who is allowed into their lives, at least to an extent. There were a lot of times where I told my kids, no, you're not going over there. No, you're not spending the night with them. That is not a home that we would allow you to go into. You know, we're made by our Creator with the need to be controlled, with the need to worship Him as our Lord and Savior. And it is so easy for, for us and for our children to allow something else to come into our life that begins to control our life. You know, the throne of our heart is highly sought after. With our children, and it's the same with us, the throne of our heart are, is highly sought after. The things of this world, the ideology of this world, the false gods of this world. And parents' authority is just a launching point for their life. It is a pattern for them to understand the authority over them so that when they continue to go through life, that that authority is over them and that there's safety in that authority and, they can, and that control can be trusted with that authority over them. We teach them who they can and who they cannot trust with the control over their lives. Have you ever found yourself celebrating a characteristic in your child's life that is not a godly characteristic? Have you ever slightly applauded and said, oh, I'm glad. And then you, really, you catch yourself and you're like, that is not a God. That isn't something God would be honored with. That isn't a characteristic that they need to have in their life. Control is simply living up to the standard of Jesus Christ. 
or at least being aware of the standard of Jesus Christ. First Peter 1, 14 and 15, it says this, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. So what he's saying there is the Lord is the authority of your life. He has control of your heart. And as a result, this is the way you are to live. He tells us in 1 Corinthians 7, 23, you were bought with a price. Do not become the slaves of men. You were bought with a price. You are the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, our parents, as, as goal, a goal for reaching the heart of the children, this, obey your parents in the Lord, the Scripture says. Obey your parents in the Lord. One day they will be out from underneath our authority. One day they will no longer be in our homes. One day their decisions will be their decisions. And so what will they do? How will they respond when they're, when they're bombarded, when they're given something, uh, an opportunity in their life? What will their choice, what will their decision making be? Um, I know of a lot of kids right now that thought they got ruined with Christian parents because that's what it said on their profile they filled out for college. Those kids are no more Christian than, than anyone else. They're no more Christian. They, they, they don't, the Lord, Jesus is not the Lord of their life. And yet they say, well, they're a Christian. But they, they come in and, and you want, hey, you want to go, go with us? We're going to try and find a church in the new town. No, church isn't my thing. No, I can't wait to get out from underneath my parents' home. No, I couldn't wait to get out from underneath the, the, what I had to do. You know, those, those kids are lost. Those kids are having authority over their life, and they've already rejected now what their parents' authority was and what they, the will was their parents. And ultimately, they're rejecting what God's will is for their life, and they are in for heartache in their life. They're in for heartache in their... Uh, both my kids have experienced this. thought you were getting Christian roommates... And it was Christian on the profile, but nothing close to it. So let's let's wrap this thing up. You as the parent is who the Lord placed in your child's life. You know, I always thought, I'm so thankful I got my children and not somebody else's children. But it didn't matter who God gave me, I was going to be happy with them. Same with you. You're happy with the children that God gave you. And those are the ones He put in your home. But more important than that, you are the one that He placed over them. They're in your care. They're in your care. So I want to challenge you with this. You love the Lord. You love the Lord. And that's modeled. It's not dictated. How do your kids see that you love the Lord? How do they know that you really love the Lord? How do they see the obedience and the submission to the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ over your life? If they can't see it in you, they're going to be hard-pressed to be doing it themselves. Secondly, don't go through the motions of serving the Lord. Teach your children why you serve Him. Teach your children why you do what you do. Why you get up. Why you go. Why your schedule is this way. Why you do this. Why this is an important part of your life. Teach your children why. Why. You teach your children where the desires for rebellion come from. They need to understand that they are a sinner. That they're going to be at times not prone to do what God expects of them. And, and we're all in that same boat. So Gabe called me uh, this week and he was really mad because he'd gotten two parking tickets and three warnings on his car for parking in the wrong lot. Now, it wasn't his fault. It was his older sister's fault. When we unloaded his car, she went and parked it. She thought she put it in a lot that he was allowed to park in. Turned out it was just faculty and staff. And uh, Gabe Mann has got a great parking place right up front. <laughs> and the security guard had been sitting there five days. Apparently, he went by and gave him one warning. The next day, another warning. The next day, another warning. Gabe never gone to his car. Because remember, he learned to ride a bike out the back of the dorm in the parking lot. <laughs> but uh, then he gets a parking ticket. And then he gets another parking ticket. And so he's just absolutely livid. He's like, I can't believe these security guards just give parking tickets. And I said, well, Gabe, okay, you know, you're, it's not your fault. It, it, just go in and explain. Try to appeal the tickets. Maybe they'll take them off because you're just an ignorant freshman. And I said, it's not like when I was in college and I couldn't even get my diploma until I paid off several hundred dollars worth of parking tickets because I always parked illegally. I always parked where I, that rebellion against the thorn. I'm not parking way back here. Are you kidding me? I'm not walking this far. It's going to rain when I'm coming out of class. I'm parking right up front, my, my sweet black Mustang. 
with the chrome wheels. It's going to be right up front. They're going to know that, it, and oh, another ticket. Let's put that in, in stack. And didn't realize, hey, you, you've got to pay these you know, before you can graduate. But we teach them there's security for having authority in their lives and where rebellion comes from. We understand that. Also, explain the blessing.